And we are rolling. We are live. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Waite. This is another edition of the OpenShift Commons Briefings Operator Hours. And what I'm going to do right now is I like to, as I like to say, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to click. It's now sharing. Now I'm going to ask the question that everyone wants to know. Can you see my screen? Hopefully the answer is yes. Yes. And today on the uh, op Operator Hours show here, we have JFrog with us. And not just JFrog, but we have Baruch Sotogursky, who is the head of developer advocacy at JFrog. And um, very happy to have you here. And, and what's interesting is today's topic is going to be all about what is liquid software. So, Baruch, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, what exactly did you mean when you titled this, What is Liquid Software? Because, frankly, I want to know. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, hey, uh, Mike, thank you for, for having me. Everybody, hello. Um, yeah, so um, probably some of you heard about JFrog and our motto, the Liquid Software Company. Um, and uh, I'm glad that um, you know people people are asking about that because it's an interesting concept. Uh, the idea of liquid software is that uh, we, as an industry, should strive to uh, move towards software updates, continuous software updates, which are so frequent and so small that it looks like software flows from the development to the target, and it almost looks like liquid. And the, the, this, uh, this concept of liquid software is about switching from bulk and rare deployments into frequent and tiny continuous updates. Okay, excellent, good, good, good intro there. So let's, let's, talk, about, uh, let's talk about you. Um, I understand from one, well, first of all, is that a little hot in the background there? I mean, you've got a fire on your wall. Is yeah, it, yeah, is technology, to, uh, you know. Switching to air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the beauty of it is that it, it doesn't emit any, well, it does emit some heat, but definitely yeah, not and on you never the have Yeah, never have to stock wood in the thing either. That's pretty cool. Exactly. So, how long, so you've been at JFrog for quite some time. What, what, what exactly does it mean to be head of developer advocacy? So, yeah, I've been with JFrog for nine and a half years almost. And um, for, for the longest time most, time, most of this time, for seven years, I was the only person in, in official developer relations capacity. The thing with developer relations that everybody do it. So I cannot say I was the only one who did developer relations because everybody do developer relations, whether they want it or not, whether they think about it or not. Um, in the end of the day, we're all in, we all affect the relationship between the company and the developers and the users. But I was the only one who was, who like had anything to do with developer relations in their title. I was the only developer advocate. Um, now uh, we grew um, a lot and we have an entire team of developer relations which contain different uh, roles, um, not only developer advocates, but also community uh, builders um, and engineers, full-time engineers um, and um, that d deal with partners, integrations and user experience. Uh, yeah. But I'm leading the developer advocates team. Okay, cool. And uh, nine and a half years. So wait, wait a minute. What? What's on your sleeve? Is that a JFrog shirt? It is a JFrog shirt. It is um, a Wonderfrog shirt. And what is your shirt? Huh? It it's. Kind of strange. I actually got up this morning and I put on this shirt that I got. Uh, I can save your binaries and you can save the world. I, I got this at a uh, got this at a trade show in Portland, Oregon, 
I think there was like a Docker con or maybe it was like one of the first Kube cons or something and, and I bumped into Raj and I, I think I wear this shirt about maybe once every two years. It's unbelievable that we both picked the same day to be putting our shirt on. Well, we might thank B B Zack Snyder for it, you know, the Snyder Cut and everything, kind of Wonder Woman is back to our minds, so maybe that's, <laughs> that's the reason. I, I got to tell you, I don't generally take T-shirts from trade shows, but Raj, you know Raj, he's no longer there anymore, but but uh, you guys like have the best T-shirts at trade shows. That's we, very true. When we get to go finally to KubeCon, which is the, the one coming up in L.A., which hopefully will be in person. I think everybody should swing over to the JFrog booth. They, honest to God, they have the best quality T-shirts, and they're they're definitely worth wearing and not turning into a a, a shop rag in your garage like most of the other ones. So. Absolutely. I I hope our software is as good as our T-shirts. Let's put it that way. <laughs> It's just an amazing coincidence that we both decided to have this shirt on at the same time. Um, so, J Frog, what's in the name? I mean, it's a frog. There's a J in front of it. Is it a Java frog? Is it, you know, John Frog? What? What? What is yeah, it? You've been yeah, there for so nine. That's... How how old is the company? I mean, is the company like a 10, 10 years old or what? Uh, yeah, the the company is actually more. The company itself been around since two thousand and 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 nine, so it's twelve years. But the the name JFrog is even uh, it's even older. It's been around since two thousand and six, uh, when the first version of uh, Artifactory came out. Um, uh, and and the, it's interesting how every time you have some kind of weird name or a fancy name, people um, always have a story, right? So the one that I keep thinking about, it's Black Duck, for example. So yeah. um, when we asked the founders of Black Duck, they told us a very touching story about the actual duck that was hurt on the property of one of the founders when he was a, a young kid and he kind of nurtured this duck to 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 health and everything else and and since then it's kind of a black duck um uh, we uh, try to come up with a story um in 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 hindsight when people started to ask so why jeff rock but you know what one of our co-founders in french and they have a weird relationship with frogs they eat their legs so i wasn't sure we weren't sure if we can come up with something that will be um, uh, that will be authentic enough. Like, what are we going to say? Fred ate some French legs, uh, frog's legs, and this is why it's frog. Doesn't sound so good. Um, but truth to be told, um, when we just started, Yoav uh, Landman, another co-founder of JFrog, started this project in Artifactory, he looked for a name for kind of a space or an organization, it wasn't a company back there, that will be catchy, that will be, um, we, we can play with, with graphics and social and stuff, and also have like a domain and a Twitter handle that, that was available. J back then really stood for Java, that's a, that's a right observation, because the software, we were all, uh, before, before JFrog, we were all in the Java consultancy shop, so Java was our expertise back then, and Artifactory is written in Java, and also back then, the only thing it did was supporting Java Maven build tool. Um, obviously, a lot of water um, under the bridge since then, now it's, it's incredibly universal, support 27 different package types, all the way from development to the ops concerns, and you know all the modern programming languages, uh, and also all the package tools on the on the operating system side, uh, and uh, the new um, services in the JFrog platform are not even written in Java anymore. Uh, but uh, but yeah, JFrog uh, has has history. Okay. I wanted to point out that you know we're live on uh, on Twitch. We're obviously live here on this Blue Jeans Bridge, and we're live on YouTube. People can ask questions for Baruch, uh, put them into the chat down below, and they'll magically pop up over here onto our bridge. So we'll be able to address them. and And we'd like to we'd like to challenge everyone to this is called this is called stump the, this is called the stump the Baruch hour. 
I'm told that there's no question too tough for Baruch. And anyone who can stump Baruch is going to get one of their very own JFrog t-shirts. It might yep. not be this one, but yep. we'll definitely get a, uh, a 2012 edition JFrog sent off to uh, anyone who can stump the Baruch. Um, so, Challenge I, just, Let's I, do just, that. I just made that up. I haven't talked to your let's marketing do people that. about I, that. I yet. have I can... no idea that this is what it is, but let's do it. I just, I just made it. So your marketing people are going to be like, Mike, what are you talking about? We don't have any. I'm like, I'll pay for it. I'll, I'll put no, it on no, my No, no, no. We have so. T-shirts. We definitely am going to send T-shirts to whoever asks great questions. And yeah. that's that's on me. I'll, I'll take care of it. Okay. No problem. So first great question from me. Um, ow. Just bang the funny bone. Perfect timing. Um, so... You're here on our TV show, the Open Shift Commons Briefings Operator Hours. It's not a mistake, right? I mean, your your technical people have been working with ours to test and certify your software on the Red Hat portfolio. It's good for customers. It you know it sends that message of like you know the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup moment of better together, my chocolate, your peanut butter. You know, J Frog and Open Shift is you know better than sliced bread. So we, you know we were interested in helping to promote your company, your agenda, and, and getting visibility for your products on, on top of our portfolio. Um, uh, what is, you know, your open source story? Yeah. I mean, every yeah. company has an open source story. You know, I'm, I'm at, you know, we're at Red Hat. We've been here for, I've been here for since 2002. So I guess like 21 years. And you know, Red Hat has a pretty solid open source story, you know, we're one of the one of the few companies that's been able to generate a billion dollars selling free software. So what's right. your story? Right. So um we started, as I already mentioned, as as an open source tool. Um 2006, Artifactory, um you can download it and 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 have a proxy for your Maven um artifacts and Maven builds. Um, since then, a lot of time passed, and we still have the, 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 the open source version, and that's obviously the most downloaded and the most used in, in, in all the software that the JFrog provides is the, is the Artifactory open source. It's still, it's still when a Java When you say tool. most downloaded, what is that, like 10,000 downloads, 100,000 downloads, like what is that? <laughs> we We stopped measuring downloads a long time ago. We have this number and it's in the millions every year. Um, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything just because, you know, as as our uh, CEO used to say, my grandma can download Artifactory. And and, right. and he's right. Uh, but but it's also a tool which is a part of a lot of uh, pipelines and tool chains. And that means that there are might be a lot of robots that download it time and time again to set up their 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 pipeline, the pipeline of the pipelines, if you wish. So, uh, bragging about downloads doesn't doesn't really make mean anything. Um, I, I was so, just trying to quantify yeah big number. <laughs> yeah, it is a big number. It is a big number, but again, we don't know why. We don't know how many of them are using it. And being like honest open source, we don't really know a whole a lot about those users. We don't have any, you know, call home, or they don't feel any. Uh, there is no paywall, so they just go ahead and and grab it and use it. Yeah. Um, and, and this is the this is the open source part. Now, um, in uh, um, as the time passed, we felt that. Um, first of all, we, we, we went very, very cloud native. I, I think the, the, the or, or cloud first, should I say, uh, the, the first usage that you think about how do we use JFrog software should be, in our perspective, you use it in the cloud, you use it in the service. Uh, you select the right cloud, and we support all of them, including obviously uh, OpenShift. Um, you select the right region, you select the right setup, and then you just consume it as a cloud. And this obviously conflicts with this downloadable open source version, right? Because downloadable open source means it's not as a service. So um, we started to think how can we maintain the accessibility 
and the ease of use of the open source version, just download and use it with, with the cloud. And this is how we now have the, uh, the free tier, uh, which is fully blown artifact Jeffro platform for whatever it is cost if you buy it for on-prem, but you can use it in the cloud for free up to, uh, up to certain limits. So this is kind of also what we uh, try to give back to the community. Now, since we have that, and it's not really open source because it's a service, right? The question is, okay, how do we keep giving back to the open source community? Because obviously all of our software uses 80% open source components, like every other software component in the world, right? We use everything from um, a bunch of frameworks and, and, and libraries. And then we decided we want to give on top of free tier even more. We want to give like fully functional with elevated limits, the entire different platform for open source uh, projects. And we run this program for many years and we have very um, uh, high, high visible open source projects in Apache and CNCF and the Linux Foundation and many others uh, used um, uh, JFrog Artifactory for free under this project. And now we re we kind of changing this program to give the entire JFrog platform for free for, for open source projects. We're going to uh, relaunch this program in our user conference, um, uh, JFrog Swamp Up, which is coming up in, uh, in May. Um, by the way, the conference is free. You're going to get some awesome JFrog t-shirts. There is tons of amazing content. Um, uh, Chris Short, who uh, was here briefly in the opening, uh, uh, spoke, uh, I think, at least twice at Swamp Up, uh, so he can attest how great this conference is, at least I hope. Uh, and yeah, during this conference, we're going to restart this program. So if you have an open source project and you look for a platform um, that will help you release faster and get eventually to the liquid software um, concept that we spoke earlier, definitely during Swamp Up, we are going to have something very nice for you to use for free just because you are that awesome and you do open source. We, we, we usually keep the uh, promotions for events uh, uh, till the end for fillers. So it's good that I jumped, didn't ask. <laughs> you jumped ahead of me. It's good I, that I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to, to basically say though, like, like, what do you guys do? Right? I mean, you've been there for nine and a half years, you know what you do. I think um, the majority of the people out there understand what artifact management is, but maybe not. Right, so like, what is it that JFrog does for the end user? So the way we phrase it is that we take care of your pipeline all the way from Git to Kubernetes or to OpenShift. Uh, what we mean by that is that once you pushed your code to Git, everything else, all the pipeline from this point onward will run on JFrog, uh, JFrog platform. Uh, we will build your code on JFrog pipelines, which is our CI and CD tool. Then you will have JFrog Artifactory as the backbone of your pipeline, and you will take this artifact, test it, whatever this test is, is it QA, security, um, licensing, performance, whatever, you will test it. And when you're happy with it, you are going to promote it to the next repository in JFrog Artifactory. The tests themselves, the security and the licensing, we are going to help you testing your dependencies, your third-party dependencies, both for security um, vulnerabilities and for license compliant using JFrog X-Ray. And in the end of the day, we, again, with JFrog Pipelines, the CD part of it, will deploy your, will distribute your application to whatever the end compute is. If it's OpenShift, it will be deployed, the containers will be deployed. If it's internal distribution, it will replicate 
to the right instances of Jeffrey Gratty Factory for other developers to use. Um, if it's edge computing, it will be delivered to Artifactory Edge and then using P2P uh, to, the, um, uh, to the compute itself. Whatever the distribution is, we will take care of distribution as well. So everything from source to the runtime, we can help you um, deliver faster. Why can't we just do that ourselves? Of course you can. I mean, that is in the end of the day, it's just software. It's just something that people wrote, so probably other people can write it as well. The question is, do you want to spend your time now writing software for your pipeline or writing software for your users and customers? When 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 I started here in 2002, I was a solutions architect, and there were one. I was one of five in the whole company. And, you know, we would travel all around the world and, and I would, you know, be going and going, you know, I'd do a tour through Singapore and then over to Japan and then make my way back or maybe to go through Australia or whatever. But we, we actually, it was amazing back in 2002 and 2003 that, you know, we were going into customers and, and everybody, there was so many Linux experts everywhere, right? And everyone was trying to become their own Linux expert to create their value and build their career around, I'm the Linux guy here at you know Reebok, or I'm the Linux guy here at this company. And the really savvy customers at the time recognized that they didn't wanna be in the business of becoming Linux experts. They wanted to be in the business of focusing on their core business, which was whatever, commercial banking or building the best tennis shoes or whatever it was. So. I, I totally get it. You know, early on in new technologies, there's always people who are like, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to, you know, but, you know, having people like Jay Frog who are like, you know, just use our tooling and then you guys go focus on your core business makes a lot of sense. Um, so that's your open source, open source story. Um, who do you, who are the other companies out there um, you know, are you the only one out there that makes, you know, and, and is it fair enough to say that artifact management is, is the two words that sums up JFrog and, and, and your, your tools? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You can say that. You can say that, absolutely, because uh, we, we get into the picture once the artifact is ready to be created and then take it through, manage it all the way through when it's ready to go live into production. So yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, so how are, how is business? I mean, you guys have one of the best t-shirts around. Uh, you've got a tremendous amount of momentum, you know, there's a lot of, you know, arts being written about J frog, but like, you know, how's business or, are, are, you know, if you look at companies that were trending, you know, Take Docker, for example, Docker, the company, not Docker, the technology, you know, they were, you know, the shiny object for years, you know, Docker, 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 and you go to Docker Con and, you know, Docker had this huge booth, but they weren't really able to convert that into a viable business. So is JFrog just a lot of hype? Do you guys just have, you know, nice, you know, purple backgrounds and, and frogs on shirts or... Are, are you folks actually becoming a dominant player out there that, that customers can really rely on to run to help run their business? So I think that was <clears throat> that was an interesting question circa 2000, what 13. Uh, and, and I think that the industry kind of gave gave its, its answer. Uh, we have more than 6,000 paying customers. Uh, I think the, the overwhelming majority of whatever Forbes top 500, 100, or whatever, we're, we're everywhere. Um, <clears throat> we went public about half a year ago, um, and I think, not that I'm a big expert, it was a successful IPO. Uh, so, um, and, and, and today, when people think about artifact management, they think about either JFrog or JFrog Artifactor in particular. So I think this, this question has been answered profoundly in the last at least five, six years. Uh, uh, and the most, 
interesting answer to that is that now everybody are doing it. Um, I remember back in the day, the whole concept of artifact management was met with a lot of skepticism. Why do you even care about the binary artifacts? I mean, you have your source. This is the most important thing. You have it in your subversion, and you can, if you need, like, you just build it and put it in production, done. There is no, there is no artifact to manage. And um, we, along other players in the industry, I would say, defined this uh, domain of artifact management defined it with with a lot of sweat and blood uh, but in the end of the day today it's something that you 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 install jfrog artifactory or you get a service versus jfrog artifactory as the prerequisite for doing anything together with your uh, github account and uh, whatever you want to use for a uh, for continuous integration and your runtime platform this became a standard in how you develop software and this is i think the biggest change that um that, that happened in the last decade and in our um in our corner of the industry if you wish uh, and the the fact that we are now that everybody are doing it and everybody are competing with jfrog in this area or another of this artifact management um, i think that's the best proof that the business is good <laughs> but are, are you guys are you guys better than i mean there's there's other companies out there that do something similar right so are you guys the uh you know the best well, I mean, why, I mean, why would I why would I want to use JFrog as opposed to you know one of yeah, the other companies? Yeah, so so if you ask name. me, I'm I'm not I'm obviously not, uh, very very biased, and I I will obviously yeah. tell you that yes, obviously we are the best. Uh, there are some objective reasons to use JFrog. I'm, I'm comparing to 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 others. Um, one of the reasons that me personally. Uh, uh, is very important. I, I find it very important. Is um, I will give you maybe three reasons real quick. The first is universal. Whatever technology you want to use, Jeffrey platform will support it. And this is very important because we don't want to dictate you as being just a part of your pipeline. We don't want to dictate you how you write your code how you build your code, what stack are you running with, what is your deployment target, what cloud you want to use. None of those should be decisions that you have to compromise on because a technology in your stack doesn't support what you want to do, right? If you want to use Rust, if you want to use Go, if you want to use Java, if you want to use C-sharp, JavaScript, if you want to pack it in containers, or Debian files, or RPM files, if you want to deploy it on the cloud, if you want to deploy it on-prem, whatever cloud you want to deploy, we have to be there supporting all of them. And this is what we do. So this is the first huge advantage. The second one is our obsession with metadata. Yeah, one of the reasons why the shift from, hey, I just have a source code and I build it and I throw it in production, um, actually happened to, hey, I need to manage my artifacts, is the understanding of the industry that there are tons of questions that you might have to answer about your artifacts in any point of life, before you deploy it, during the pipeline after you deploy it, when you operate it, when you monitor it, the more you know about your artifacts, the better. And this is why we in JFrog pour tons of effort into getting you as much metadata about your artifacts as possible. How they were created, from what sources, using what tools, in which point, how the promotion went, which decisions did you make, why did you make those decisions, who made those decisions, so when you need to answer questions like, what is this artifact? How it came to be? Why it was deployed the way it was deployed? Why it was built the way it was built? You will have all those answers at the ready. 
And when you need to go back in time and find the right artifact for any reason that you might have, you have all this metadata there. And this, the third one is being truly a hybrid or amphibious, as we call it, because frogs, in the way that you deploy it and use it. On-prem, in the cloud, any cloud, multi-cloud, hybrid between on-prem and, uh, and the cloud, integration between any type of deployment of any part of JFrog platform, this is something that also becomes very, very relevant. Kind of the same of the first one, we want to support you, whatever your right topology is, but not only for your stuff, but also for our stuff as well. The cloud being cloud first, and starting the conversation with, hey, here's a service, just use it, is obviously great and important, and that's another advantage over some of our competitors, but also being able to recognize, hey, you want it on-prem, here you go, you, we have that as well, this is advantage over other, other competitors. And being able to say, okay. hey, you know what? Use it together. Use some of the JavaScript factory instances on-prem and some on the cloud, and then combine them, replicate between them, and work with them together. That's another advantage over any others. All right, cool. I know we had some people join late. I, I just wanted to remind people, if you're watching on Twitch or YouTube or you're here on the bridge, that you know you want to get one of these cool JFrog shirts, drop a question in chat. It can't be anything like, do you think it's going to snow this weekend? And actually, by the way, speaking of snow this weekend, uh, tomorrow we're getting eight inches during the day and another three. So we're getting 11 inches of snow tomorrow night. Um, but any any interesting questions that are not about how much snow Mike Waits getting at his at his summer house, drop them in chat there, and uh, we will ship a shirt off to you. If you do ask a question, then just shoot me an email. My email address is wait at redhat.com. That's just w a i t e at redhat.com, and be like, hey Mike, this is uh, Sarah. You know, ship me a shirt. I want to have a J Frog shirt like you and Baruch. Um, so what about um, you know, what about Kubernetes and, you know, are like, this is one of the questions we talked about when you and I were going over this concept of doing the show a couple of weeks ago. You know, like, it's sort of like, are we there yet? Like I said, I've been here, I'm, I'm as old as dirt. I've been here since when Red Hat had 260 employees and, you know, there was, you know, Linux was hot, you know, way back in the day and, then it became, you know, virtualization with Zen and KVM and VMware sort of, you know, ran away with the, ran away with, with that one. Um, you know, then OpenStack became like the big hot topic and it was like the OpenStack conference and everyone was flying around. Those were hosted, you know, what were they, two, two times a year and Portland, Tokyo, all over the place. Then that kind of like just became this little niche thing for telco. And then there were containers, and it was like Docker, 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 and containers aren't really new, right? I mean, containers have been around for as long as me, right? I mean, there was Solaris zones, they had containers, just people couldn't figure out how to use them or manage them. And then, you know, containers kind of stopped being the focus, now it's Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes, 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 and, or, you know, orchestration management, and Everybody was trying to get in on this game, kind of like the OpenStack thing, right? This technology shows up and there's like 20 different vendors and everyone's going to become the OpenStack vendor. There was Marantis and HP invested millions and millions of dollars and was it Helion trying to become the OpenStack vendor and, you know, Red Hat kind of just kept plugging along, building our open source technologies, delivering great product for customers and everyone kind of went away and forgot about it. Long story short, containers, same thing. Every, you know, you know, Docker, the company, kind of like went poof. But now everyone's trying to become a Kubernetes vendor, you know, and, <laughs> you know, you got Tanzu out there and all the other offerings as well. Do you think that, that where we are now, Baruch, is just another sparkly moment? And do you think that, that like, all this hype and everyone's getting ready, we're going to go off to KubeCon in Los Angeles in October and everyone's going to go get their new JFrog shirt and, Two years from now, we'll be sitting there saying, wow, man, remember that? Like, we all thought, like, Kubernetes was, like, the end game. And now we're off on to, uh, 
you know, na you know, name your t like, are we there? That's my question for you. Very long introduction. But then again, I figured seeing as we're each getting paid by how many words we use today, I figured I'd get my quota in, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, that so, was that was real good. And that was a great description of the great evolution of the um, of the industry through like, I don't know how many years. What I wanted to point is that this is really all those peaks. They are really ch uh, parts of the same process. In the end of the day, virtualization is built on Linux. Containers are not exactly built on virtualization, but learned a lot from virtualization. Kubernetes exists because of containers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't think those are kind of things that we play with and these and then throw away. Those the, those are the things that we play with and then take it to the next level. And um, this trend will obviously continue. Kubernetes now is the hottest kind of uh, thing that we that we play with, and it will become commoditized and like today we think about containers well huh, containers everything is containers of course and this is something that will be with with orchestration kubernetes or not we'll say well containers obviously they are orchestrated of course um and and the next thing will be will be something else and i think uh, personally i think that this next thing that we will all be obsessed with very shortly will actually be the edge computing um, and and I think that's the next frontier, if you wish. Distribution, runtimes, um, billions of runtimes running everywhere, and us being able to deliver the software there, and then manage the <coughs> software there, and then update the software there, will be the next frontier for all of us. This is what we are going to be excited about. This is what about what we are going to be buzzed about, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. So what what about what about what about I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw out I'm gonna throw out let's let's call this buzzword bingo. And you tell me if, you know if if the buzzword bingo is fact or fiction ready okay. this I is am. this is this is my this is my uh geez, i watched i watched the 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 uh tonight show with jimmy fallon last night i don't know if anyone watched that but it was it was hilarious you know he does these things where he has people zoom in from their house showing off their talent and there was like one woman was like i can sound like a I can sound like a seagull. She was actually calling in from like Spain or something. Anyways, so this is our buzzword bingo fictor, fiction or fact. Microservices and serverless. Do you really think that serverless and microservices are fact or fiction? Uh, I have a problem with both terms. I have a problem with the term microservices because of the emphasis on the size, which I don't think is the most important thing in microservices architecture. Um, instead, there are diff more important aspects like the API centric, the serviceability, the being able to, um, the, the resilience, uh, the scalability and the others, which are much more important uh, traits of microservices than the fact that they are micro. But it's definitely a thing that the architecture, um, this the microservice architecture is one of the cornerstones of being a cloud native, which is probably another one on your list. We'll get to it soon. Um, serverless, I also have a problem with the name because it implies that there are no servers, which is obviously a, a bullshit. There is a server. You just don't have direct access. It's abstracted it, from you. It's just which somebody is, else's servers, right? Exactly. It's abstracted from you, and this is great. We love abstractions, and it's, it's encapsulated from you, and it's great. We love encapsulation, but it's, again, not the main part of it. <laughs> 
so both concepts are, are are great and very important. Naming is hard, as we know. I find both of those names being suboptimal, but it is what it is. And, and you know, it. I mean, the buzzword bingo. We could. We we should actually make that a standard part of the show every week. Maybe absolutely, we can, uh, absolutely. Maybe. You know, I mean, there's lots of like. Look, let's talk about cloud native fact or fiction. Yeah, again, cloud native is um, is a fact, and uh, the name in this one actually annoys me a little bit less, although maybe it's still not perfect. Um, for me, cloud native is a collection of patterns, and <laughs> microservices architecture being one of them, that actually makes the application run um, better, I would say, on the cloud. It's it's more suited for the cloud, and when I say the cloud, um, that's where the problem with the name is. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the cloud. It's just a set of practices of how we treat software. The fact that you know it's observable and we can scale it, and we can replace parts of it as as it moves and we can commi commission and decommission and recommission part of it. So um, it's, um, it's again set of practices that makes our software better and the fact that we kind of came into this conclusion through the cloud is, is secondary, but it's stuck in the name. Okay, and, and you know, the, the whole microservices thing, I, I wanted to bring that up because we had we did a show a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about microservices and the, the, the partner of ours that was on, you know, made an API gateway and a service mesh offering. And and I, I believe that, you know, that type of tooling is going to be absolutely mandatory as containers do get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller over time. It's like trying to manage an infinite number of galaxies, you know, and having, you know, service mesh tooling to do that does make it helpful. but there were people on the on the bridge who were commenting that they see containers going the other way and that their containers are actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger and measured in like you know gigabytes in size which i i found i found surprising but then again it was someone in the government space so they probably have they probably have very weird internal uh you know reasons for doing that so what what about you know for 18 months out, you know, we were talking about, are we there? You know, is is Kubernetes the container, the OpenStack, the Linux of the day? You know, where do you see computing being in, in 18 months? Are containers going to be tiny? Is the service mesh, you know, uh, offerings going to be something that's going to be just like, you know, uh, table stakes for doing business, um, you know, are there going to be new disruptive technologies coming down the road? Where do you, what do you think we'll we'll see in, in eighteen months? Yeah, yeah. So I already mentioned edge computing, and I really believe this is where everything is going. And as the cloud imposed the, its own uh, um, style of software development, what we call cloud computing, regardless of it's in the cloud or not, the edge computing will impose its own style of development some that we'll call probably the edge computing, and and uh, this is what actually guarantees the minimization of uh, of images, if you like, just because the limitation of the edge devices. If you need to, ins to, to run software on a relatively small and uh, not as powerful as all the cloud servers, you will do, you will have to do, you will have to adjust, and you will have to make your containers smaller and uh, the microservice is really micro and um, everything that, that comes with those with those limitations. So I think they will, uh, Edge will impose on us limitations that will make our software even better and that will make our software development practices more robust because of the challenges. Think about, for example, the availability of the target. We assume now that whenever we want to go and do something with our services in the cloud, it's always there. We can update, we can scale, we can we can restart, we can do whatever we like. 
With edge computing, the availability of the target is not guaranteed. And once that happens, it brings a lot of interesting engineering questions. It might be the different edges within one cluster runs different versions of software because some of them were unavailable when other got updated. How can we make sure that this cluster operates correctly when actually they run different types of different versions of software? There are very a, a lot of very interesting engineering challenges that come with um, the edge problem space and it will definitely impact of how we develop our software for the for the better. Okay. Um, we've got 12 minutes left and I, I know that we wanted to talk about some aha moments and or you know war stories. You're 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 really well plugged into your business. You're obviously you know being head of the developer advocacy you know team there at um, at JFrog. You probably have heard a lot. Can you you want to tell us about some aha moments or some some you know war stories that you wanted to share with people? Yeah. So. Uh, and that will be more about general developer relations kind of um, journey that that I personally experienced and, and my personal growth, if you wish, which kind of goes into why I always I always thought why I don't get those aha moments like a lot of them. Why uh, obviously we have software that solves a real world problem, right? I speak with people, I hear what problems they try to sell, to, to solve. I see how our software clearly answers this need and I explain to them how it helps. And this is where I expect rational human beings to think about and they say, yeah, you know what Baruch, you're right. This software is going to make our life easier and this is my aha moment, and this is what I take back to the business and say, hey, I just spoke with, um, um, with Mike, and Mike said, it's great, that's exactly what they need, they're going to use it. That almost never happens. Instead, what I've learned is that the only thing, or, or most of the time, the only thing that I can do is make you or any other people that I speak with think about the domain. And then sometime later, a month later, two months later, half a year later, they have the realization that, hey, I need to look for some software that will help me doing it. And you know what? I remember Baruch mentioned something about JFrog. Let me check it. Oh, it, it fits. And then what a great idea. But that was the idea of this individual. Very, very rarely they will come back to me and say, hey, Baruch, remember this conversation that we had? You were right. JFrog is what I actually need, and now I'm starting using it. Most of the time, it will be like, hey, Baruch, you tried to push me this JFrog stuff when I didn't need it. It's good that I then kind of uh, refused to use it because I didn't need it th 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 then. Now the situation is completely different and I by myself came to the conclusion that JFrog is the right thing to do. So I did it and it's not kind of your, your um, achievement if you wish. And that's okay. I mean, I really don't mind. As long as in the end of the day, people come to the same conclusion, it's, it's completely fine. Uh, and more of everything, it's the aha moment for me that you really cannot push the a solution into a throat of other people, even if this is objectively the right way for them to do. This realization should really come internally. And I think there is a movie about that called Inception. Um, this is what I like to think about the de developer relations is doing. Inception of the ideas, in the heads of other people that then will come to the realization that this is the right thing to do without 
constantly being able to correlate it to some conversation that you had half a year ago, if that makes sense. Sure. Yep. Um, let's talk about Swamp Up. Um, it's it. I went there once. It it's a it's a developer. It's a unique focus show as opposed to like bankers walking around, people carrying suits and bags and stuff. Right. I know it was at uh, it was at a it was at a winery in Santa Barbara about four years ago. Do you remember that one? Yep. Yeah, it. I went there. Raj it was, was Napa. Trying to get, it, Raj was, was, it was Napa. Yeah, it was at some some winery. It was really cool. Napa. Yep. What you know for people who go and and again, it's not a customer conference. It's not people carrying you know suitcases, uh, you know like briefcases around. You know what what's the overall experience at Swamp Up? It's it's coming up here in the, in the not so distant future. And this this. This is your chance to put in that gratuitous plug for your, for your event here, because uh... yeah. So uh, thank you for uh, for building it up like officially, and uh, and yeah. So um, Swamp Up is is a user conference as opposite to a customer conference, as you mentioned. And our users are developers, our um, ops people, are engineers. In the end of the day. Uh, so this is the conference for them, and uh, what uh, I have the honor to be the head of the content committee for uh, the last uh, six Swamp Ups. There were six, so all all of them. And does, what does we... that mean? Does that mean that if I if I fill out a call for paper, I get prioritization because I know absolutely, you? Mike. Absolutely, you will have to wait for 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 next year because this year's agenda is is already built. Uh, yeah. But uh, yes, I expect you to submit. Uh, I also have a very sweet spot for uh, for 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 speakers from Red Hat and Chris won't let me lie uh, on this one. So yeah, we try to make the content useful for engineers. That's, that's our main goal. Um, we have an amazing events team, and their main goal is to make it fun and uh, pleasurable for, for yeah. everybody attending. Uh, one, when we uh, could do it in real life, um, f four conferences out of five took place in the winery in Napa, and that's yeah. because we started to drink wine in the morning and we actually never stopped. Uh, Actually, Baruch, some people call that day drinking. Some people call that maybe, you know, might, you know, be a time to uh, take things in moderation. I call it swamp up. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah. And and this year, it's uh, it's unfortunately still, um, um, still online. It's going to be an awesome conference, but you have to bring your own wine. Uh, but hopefully next year we will be able to meet again. I hope it will again be in, in Napa in a winery with this amazing experience. Uh, talking about content, um, this year was really hard. We got more than 150 submissions for I think like a 27th slots. It was it was brutal, uh, the selection. And, and we obviously picked the, the best of the best and uh, it's free. It's um, May 25th, um, absolutely free to attend. Go to swampup.com uh, uh, swampup or jeffrock.swampup.com. Just Google Swampup. It's, it's an often a unique name. And, and then, um, you know, you sign up and, uh, and you're in. Okay. We have just a couple minutes left. What, uh, what is the, the one thing that you should be sharing with people that are watching live today and also for the ones that are going to be watching the recordings on YouTube and, and, and uh, LinkedIn and so forth that, you know, after we hang up here, your, your manager or your, you know, your CTO isn't going to call you and say, Baruch, you had an hour to talk about anything you wanted around architecture, man artifact management, and why didn't you talk about the following two things? What, what is that? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think we're good. I think they should be happy uh, with me by now. We spoke about a lot of stuff JFrog related, a lot of stuff Liquid Software related. You know what? There is something. There is something. Aha, uh -huh. see, and, I told you. And, 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 and this is something that I really want to treat 
um, the, the the viewers of of our show um, um, on top of T-shirts. Uh, the the concept of liquid software was explained in a book with the same name, uh, Liquid Software, that was written by two co-founders of JFrog, you, uh, Fred Simon, Joav Landman, and um, yours truly. And I want to give this book for whoever wants to get it for, for free. I will make sure to ship a physical hard copy to whoever contacts you, Mike, or contact the show through whatever um, whatever channels you 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 feel right and um, you can also d d DM me on Twitter I'm Edge Baruch on Twitter and my DMs are open uh, ping me I will I will ship you a book so you will be able to learn more about liquid software that's pretty cool you're one of the one of the, one of the uh, co-founders of the company I failed to mention that. Do you have a copy of it? You can hold it up here and put it, you know, in front oh, of the camera yes, so people can see. Yes, I need to find it. Talk about, talk about gratuitous lux. I mean, man, this is like this is end game right here. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't see it around my desk. It's probably in the other room. But uh... okay. Well, that would be embarrassing if you actually had, you know, signed copies sitting there in, in your office. Just my own. Like... Yeah, yeah. That would be like a little bit. A little bit unhealthy, but, but, but that's what I cool. Will... So anyone, oh, wait who a second, wants... wait a second. I have a solution for you. What you I'm do. going to do here is I'm going to share the cover in the stream. Let me just. Open and we it have Google. we have the technology to do that. It's amazing. You know what? The technology is just. It's the uh, the screen. We're using blue jeans. The screen share buttons up at the top. Yeah. Do you just? Yeah. yeah. No, I won't be able to because my Mac got updated between we when we did the uh, our dry run and today. So now it needs permissions to share my computer again, my screen again, uh, that's and this will require to restart the bridge, and we're not going to do it. No, no, that's fine. But but to, to just rehash, anyone who wants a copy of Baruch's new book, Liquid Software. Uh, shoot me an email. Just wait at redhat.com. W a i t e redhat.com, and we'll be sure to get a copy of his latest book out to you. We are coming up on the end of the hour, so I'm going to do what I like to call. I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to pop up this that's pre-prepared from from um, from you folks. Um, Baruch Sadorsky, nine and a half years at JFrog, you know, well entrenched even before that with the other founders of the company. Thanks for thanks for being on our show here today. I'm really hoping that we can do a podcast with you. We've got a Red Hat X podcast series that we do uh, two or three shows a week. So I'd really love to have you on our podcast show. Um, anyways, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us here today, and thanks for people joining our show. Come back and see us next Wednesday at noon Eastern time. And uh, that's all for now. So, Mike, thank you very everybody. much for having me. Thank you. Okay.